Welcome, everybody, to Into the Valley, a Phoenix Suns podcast. Uh, I am Ethan Shutt, joined by my brother Ryan Shutt and Philip Russell. Uh, and if you're curious and you said, that podcast sounded a little different than before, you betcha. Uh, we came across another podcast uh, that was just on YouTube, not on the other one. So when I was doing my searching for getting a name together, I missed it. Uh, they kindly informed us of the error. And so we've tweaked it a little bit back to our originality, but new name, same show. We appreciate that you're back and listening with us. Uh, gentlemen, a lot has happened since we recorded last. Uh, our last episode was recorded last Monday um, during the Grizzlies game, which was very convenient for us. We all live in Kentucky. And as much as the league past gives, it also takes away. And so due to blackouts and things like that, we actually can't watch those games live. We've got to go back and watch the recordings. So we were like, well, might as well go ahead and record while keeping up with it on our phones. So since our last episode, we've had a game Monday, the doubleheader Thursday, Friday, and then we had last night's game against the Lakers. Uh, What jumped out to you guys the most since last week? We're still trucking, man. After starting eight and eight on the season, we're twenty and five, which is a, a phrase I don't think I ever, uh, as a Suns fan, thought I would mutter. Uh, but twenty and five in a twenty-five game stretch is pretty darn good. Uh, and I am, you know, even with the loss to the Timberwolves, which was an ugly loss, it was a loss that, in my opinion, shouldn't have happened. Uh, I'm worst. <laughs> we are still we're still rolling with an opportunity, really, to strike at the top of the conference. Yeah, and the the big things that stood out to me this week actually feel like smaller things, which we'll get to we'll get to later when we dive into the the finer points of this weekend, the wins and the losses. But that's a good thing in my mind for Suns fans because that means that the Suns are good enough to be at a point where it's time for nitpicking. It's time for hard discussions about who needs to be traded the last few days, who can be brought in not to make a playoff run, but to make a deep playoff run. The playoffs seem to be pretty set in stone. The Suns, barring anything tragic, are on a trajectory for the playoffs. And now it's about, again, tweaking the lineup, tweaking the rotations to see how deep into the playoffs they can go. Yeah, and looking at this upcoming week, we've got a game against the Heat, the Magic, the Raptors, and the Hornets. And the reason that's an interesting grouping, uh, one, I definitely think those are good games. I, I don't think this is a week where we go in thinking we're going to steamroll. Like, that's tough. Uh, and if you're watching on YouTube, if you ever want to know who we're playing next, feel free to look behind Ryan. He's got the uh, beautiful schedule there for you. Uh, but the one thing I really do like about this week is every loss – we're not giving up a win to another Western conference team. So in terms of playoff implications, it's very much a, we control what we do. We're not going to be helping the other teams climb back into it when we fail. So hopefully you take care of business. You put yourself in a better situation. Uh, But again, these aren't easy games coming up. Uh, The heat obviously are the defending Eastern conference champions. They look like they're starting to figure it out, which is very scary. uh, If you're someone in the East, Uh, especially with all the injuries happening across the league. Any team that's healthy right now should scare you a little bit. Uh, The Magic, really fun one for me because I have no idea who's going to be on that team in two days. They seem to be the biggest team in terms of like, I forgot, someone tweeted out, it's like, here are here's every player on the Magic roster. I mean, it's almost like a video game or a board game. It's like, how many chips do I have to trade in for him? It's like Gordon, multiple firsts and a young promising talent. Uh, and you know, just just down the line all the way to Evan Forney and like, eh, just give us someone good, I guess that's young. And so I think that team could look completely different. I think Kyle Lowry is not going anywhere for the Raptors. And then you've got the Hornets who are going to have to be figuring out how to operate uh, post LaMelo ball, which stinks. That's a huge injury that's happened within the last week. LeBron, obviously high ankle sprain right before our game against them uh, last night, which if you watch that game, when LeBron is not there and Anthony Davis is not there, it is pretty clear that they're not exactly uh, the team to be too scared of. I mean, they'll still beat us because I said that, but the series is clinched in terms of the Lakers Suns series. So that's great if you're looking at the division. Uh, but all in all, I feel like kind of the thing that jumps out to me the most about this past week was the Timberwolves back to back. Philip, it was 
what felt like to me a classic Suns loss this year on Thursday night. Uh, did you get a chance to to watch that one or go back and watch that one? Yeah, so I rewatched the game this afternoon. And there were there were a couple of things that that stood out. Uh, the Suns pick and roll defense, and then Da just in a one on one matchup with Cat allowed Anthony Towns to get off to a fairly quick start, get a couple good looks in the first quarter. That was compounded with Da getting two quick fouls and being out of the game with like six and a half minutes, I think, left in the in the first quarter. And then then the thing that stood out in in that game and the guys on the on the broadcast were talking about this the bench didn't do what we've grown accustomed to the bench doing between the end of the third and into the fourth we're used to seeing the suns extend their leads to the 10 to 15 range the bench came in and in the fourth quarter right around a 10 point lead but by the time the starters came back in the lead was down to six and then the Timberwolves just kind of hung around just enough to allow um, the Ant-Man and Cat to take over the game down, down the stretch. So the typical recipe for the Suns just didn't come to fruition during that game. And, and I'm sure we could go in and talk about uh, what we would have liked to see from DA, from DA down the stretch. But it's not just going to fall on him. The, the rhythm of a Suns win just wasn't there. Yeah, and on top of that, too, I think – the the volatility surrounding DeAndre Aiden is one I've never seen with a Suns player ever. This is it's insane. Uh, if you're following along on Suns Twitter or even the message boards, Reddit, whatever, you either love him or hate him, and you have a very strong opinion about it. Uh, and I do want to at least show him a little grace regarding that game. One for your point, the foul trouble early threw off a lot of the typical rotations, the typical rhythm. Uh, but on top of that, when you're allowing him and Anthony Edwards to combine for 30 of 55 shooting. Like that is definitely not one person didn't do their job. I mean, Anthony Edwards dropped 42 towns with 41. I mean, you drop that. I mean, that's just, you're not winning that game. I'm sorry. Uh, when you know, those are the two weapons you have to protect yourself against. You can't let that happen. So I don't want it to be a DA cost us this game. And there's some in the past where I think his lackadaisical nature probably would be enough for me to kind of peg it on him, but I didn't see that. Uh, it really was. It just seemed like things weren't clicking like we're used to seeing them. Uh, but I will say I was really happy Friday night seeing them right the ship. Uh, it reminded me, and again, the Timberwolves, they're tricky. They have talent, but they have an awful record. I think they had nine wins going into Thursday night's game. It reminded me a lot of the loss to the Nuggets back in like week two or three, where it's we're playing the same team back to back. The first one you lose, I think, in overtime. How are you going to respond the next day? Are you going to make the proper switches? Are you going to change things? Are you going to be able to split the series? Because dropping two games in a row in at all is awful, let alone to the same team. And so I was glad to see that get fixed for them to come out the next night. Uh, and honestly, the stuff that you mentioned, Philip, that looked bad, those things looked a whole lot better. Um, Ryan, in terms of this week, any anything stick out to you? I know you watched a good bit of the Lakers game last night as well. Uh, anything jump out to you this week? Well, I think like you, to me, Friday night may be the most encouraging. Um, to see a, a team give up an embarrassing loss after being ahead, you know, for most of the game, um, to a team that Ru Ricky Rubio has even commented doesn't have much identity, um, to come back Friday night and win – win you know a 12 point victory that's reassuring to me for the playoffs where you do have those all right we've got you for seven games can i take a punch to the jaw and respond and i know again the timberwolves timberwolves aren't necessarily the upper echelon of the nba right now True. but it's it's very much the same recipe of can we get beat by you and how do we respond the next night so i was encouraged by the friday night game uh and then we, we saw uh, you know D.A. being D.A. against the Lakers, obviously without LeBron or, or Anthony to, to manhandle him. Um, but when when your only big man really giving anything is Montrezl Harrell, you're in a, a tight spot as the Lakers were. But to see uh, to see D.A. respond Sunday night 
put up the game he did and to get a good win against the Lakers. Now's the time to strike. And I think they, they did that. Um, we're going to lose those kind of games. That's been our, our, our MO all season where we're going to go stretches of winning and then we're going to blow one that we shouldn't. Uh, and so to see us respond was just really encouraging and gives me hope for, you know, those maybe back to back or day off rest games uh, come playoff time. What, what bothered me funny enough, although Friday was encouraging in terms of the result, what bothered me the most was I wanted Aiton to come back with a vengeance Aiden's law. <laughs> and so, yeah, that's exactly where I'm going with this. So Friday night, again, the win against the Timberwolves, DeAndre Aiden stat line, 18 minutes, uh, three of seven from the field, six rebounds, eight points and five fouls. That is an atrocious game. Uh, and luckily the bench was working. Uh, everything else was working. You get the win. You kind of brush by, by that. Uh, but Cody Hunt, one of my favorite Twitter followers who does a lot of stuff in the, in the Suns world, uh, has a, a new law. And so I, this started back when the folks at the Timeline podcast, uh, Sam Cooper, Mike Vigil, all of them had Bridges Law, which is if Mikhail Bridges makes the first three or his first three of the game, the Suns will win. And to their credit, I think there was a point where they were like nine and two, 10 and two with that. Uh, things started to uh, falter a little bit. And so now Aiton's Law, and I'll, I'll read it here from Cody Hunt, nine times in his career, DeAndre Ayton has had a game of under 10 points and 10 rebounds while shooting under 50% from the field. And then here's what he's done after those games. And it is a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine game sample size. After a game that bad, Aiton has averaged 20 points, 11.2 rebounds, shot 57% from the field, and 80% from the free throw line. Uh, so I tweeted back at them that basically what you're telling me is that if we want Aiton to be good, we need him to really suck. Uh, and unfortunately, if you are taking that Aiton's law and applying that to the playoffs, uh, that doesn't work out so well. The uh, we need him to hit rock bottom for him to get his head out of his metaphorical behind, if you will, and put together a dominant game. And we saw that dominant game, Ryan, like you said, Sunday night against the Lakers. Uh, cav Asterisk. Caveat without Anthony Davis or LeBron with Harold being the primary defender. Uh, but it is something to see. And I I will keep this one anonymous and we'll we'll touch on this a little later with with D.A., uh, you know what? I'll say that. I'll save that for later. Cause that's a little spicy, spicy, and I don't want to burn you too quick. Uh, go ahead, Philip. Yeah. Let me just add one thing about this week. So obviously positives in the win I, in rewatching the, the loss today, uh, surprise, I'm going to say something glowing about Mikhail Bridges. Uh, he Always had fun. eight assists, eight assists in that. that, in that loss. And they, they popped his assists and his playmaking were fantastic in that in that game. My my biggest takeaway besides wanting more consistency from D this week is I think it's ready to unlock Mikhail a little bit more. Uh, his decision making, his his first step is just lightning quick. I want to see I want to see Mikhail as used as a secondary playmaker off of Booker or Paul pick and rolls. I want to see the wit to Mikhail and see what he can do off the, off the dribble because he has been really good and he is so long and lanky that Mikhail, just like he can on the defensive end, he can get a guy like DA going with simple drop-offs and dunks for, for DA. So again, besides consistent DA, let's, uh, Unleash, unleash Mikhail, not just on corner threes, but on, I know. on some drives as well. I try to keep my expectations at a reasonable level for Bridges, but what he has shown so far is just absurd with his growth. Uh, and Sam Cooper, again, one of the guys at the timeline, tweeted out this stat that Mikhail's currently having the third most efficient shooting season by a third-year player in NBA history. Right now, he has a true shooting percentage of 66.8%. Uh, and I'm not going to go into the weeds of what true shooting percentage means. In a sense, it's basically what the name is saying. It takes the field goal percentage of shots that are harder to make and weights that accordingly, shorter ones weights that accordingly, twos versus threes, and basically gives you a better idea of, look, no matter where they're shooting from, here is a better idea of their shooting percentage. And the fact that he is at 
elite level for a third year player just continues to make me feel like a Kawhi Leonard thing could happen. And that's when I have to pump the brakes and say, Ethan, it's only year three. You never know. But then you go back and look at Kawhi's stats from his first couple years when he's learning and developing and going from defensive monster to offensive guy, reshaped his shot, expanded to the perimeter. And man, it gets you excited because the things that you usually have to worry about a player developing are the intangibles or the things that are just innate and second nature. And for me, those are the when to cut, when to pass, when to switch, when to communicate. And those are the things that it seems like Bridges was born with. Uh, so yeah, I don't want to get on a, of like our 18th rant about Bridges, but man, he, it just gets me excited to think of where his ceiling is. Cause I think it's way higher than people probably gave him credit for coming well, out of and let's just, let's just hope Robert Sarver's got a good savings account because that kid deserves to be paid. Give him as much money as needed. Yes. Give him as much money as you can. Like that's if, if you're talking about one of the most efficient shooters in history for his point in his career, plus he's showing flashes of brilliance off the bounce in playmaking and a lockdown defender. What, what else do you want from this yeah, guy? I think, I Un- think that kid unlock is going to get paid way more than anybody anticipated when we, when we made that move for him and, uh, and it, the, Deserves every penny. Every penny, my Every guy. single every penny, penny. That is, is deserved. I'll be honest with you. That's one where every time people bring up the Aiton versus Luca thing, I'm just like in the back of my mind. One day people are gonna be like, "You traded Zaire Smith for McK- like that? What you gave up Bridges for Zaire Smith and another pick? Like, it? We're not out of the realm of possibility where one day that is a thing that gets discussed. And and Suns fans, I'm not as familiar with like the Suns discourse um, widely. But we're all we're all on the same page that Mikhail gets paid, even if that means DA can't get one hundred percent. Yep, and we're gonna we're gonna close right. we're gonna close with a little uh, DA talk, which I know makes people really happy or really sad. Uh, but want to hit the pause button real quick before we move on uh, to a few highlights of the week, and just say to those listening on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you are listening. Thank you, first of all. Uh, If you have not subscribed, feel free to do so. Uh, Hit us with a rating on there. Uh, If it's a bad one, I just ask that you would reconsider. Uh, But hit us with a five-star review. Hit us with some comments. Uh, And if you're watching on YouTube, hello. I can actually wave at you. Uh, We we appreciate how well our YouTube channel is doing. Uh, I'm not going to say it was an afterthought, but... uh, I know that everyone makes a joke that there's a million sons podcast. There's a new one every week. Uh, It seemed like YouTube was a good space to kind of branch out, see if we could uh, get some footing. And the feedback has been phenomenal. Our last video hit over 500 views, which is nuts. And even cooler than that, the average viewer time was insane. So you're actually listening, which makes us really happy. It makes this even more enjoyable knowing that there's a few people out there listening. So feel free to subscribe here as well. If you're watching that, Uh, But that said, we continue on. There is one little thing. It's not a huge conversation piece, but worth noting. Something really cool happened last night. Chris Paul getting his, this this number sounds insane, 10,000th assist. That is absurd. Uh, Incredible company, obviously. If you look at the list ahead of him, this might be a little extreme. There's a chance he could finish two or three at the end of his career. One is untouchable. I I know he made mention of John Stockton's record eating at him in the post game interview. I'm sorry if I, I don't foresee him hitting 15,000 assists. Uh, but what's even crazier is LeBron's like what two ranks below him. Maybe he's going to hit his 10,000th either this season or next season. I think uh, so. Pretty cool to be able to see two players in our generation that we've watched beginning to end be able to not just be the prolific scorers and you know what I mean like. There's a lot to it. These are really good basketball players. What are you thinking, Philip? What have you done 10,000 times in your lifetime? Pooped. <laughs> That's probably <laughs> averaging four to five a day. How many days do I have to be alive for that? Four to five a day, homie? We can discuss that later, but yes, right. sir, regularity is key. <laughs> I'm I don't not know. sure I've done 10,000 Hey, anything. YouTube, we, lo- we love our YouTube viewers. Sound off in the comments below if you're listening this far. What have you done 10,000 times in your lifetime? 
we oh, want man. in. That's an interesting one. Yeah, it's that's insane. And again, you think how crazy that is, and then you think the fact that John Stockton is at fifteen thousand, uh, just absurd. Uh, next, I guess, and this is not as much a conversation, just kind of a quick Q and A. Right now, with LeBron out for what could be at least a month, and the fact that it seems like the Suns' momentum isn't slowing down. Have you guys kind of changed your views on where the Suns can end up at the end of the, end of the season in terms of the Western Conference? I think it depends on how long the injury. A high ankle sprain, you could be anywhere between three to eight weeks. I think the Lakers have said three to four is the expectation. Um, but if I'm the Lakers and I can rest LeBron the last few weeks of the season going into the playoffs, I'm doing it. There's a very real chance that two is not out of reach by any means. And depending on the Jazz, who have not been as hot as they were, one is not far-fetched anymore. Yeah, the Jazz right now, so if you're looking at the last 10 games, which is, you know, a made-up metric of how you're doing in terms of uh, positive, negative momentum here, uh, right now the Jazz are 5-5 and in their last 10 games. So they have finally slowed down. We talked about that too, you know. We talked about that when we were kind of, I think two or three episodes ago, gauging what could happen We anticipated the Lakers and Clippers to kind of stay consistent. Too much talent not to. The Jazz had a lot going right for them to get in this position. That has changed a little bit, and we've seen that with some of these bad losses they're taking. But right now the Suns are two games back from the Jazz, which is just wonderful. They're a game above the Lakers, and that's going to grow. I don't care if LeBron's out one week, one month. That gap will continue to spread, I believe. Clippers are four games uh, behind the Jazz, two games behind. And then you've got Nuggets and Blazers tied at the five and six seed. And then what I think is going to be something definitely worth watching, I guess at first for entertainment value, but also because there is a tiny chance the Suns end up having to play one of these teams in the first round. You have the Spurs, Mavs, Warriors, and Grizzlies all in that seven, eight, nine, ten. They keep jumping each other. And boy, how fun is that playing tournament going to be if those are the four teams? So again, the only thing that does terrify me, if you are the two seed, uh, we're seeing it with March Madness uh, with UCLA. Sometimes if you get those early games in the tournament, you start feeling yourself, you get those early wins. You've just got that little bit of extra confidence. Maybe that's not a thing for the pros, but uh, right now the Suns would be playing a winner from that playing tournament, which is pretty crazy. Uh, So yeah, I think, I don't think the two seeds that crazy to think about, uh, one, it's ridiculous, but one seed is obtainable too. I'm just not going to let myself get that excited. I think excited. we also have to be fair though and say in the same way that the Jazz have slowed down, we very much could slow down as well. Again, and we've talked about it probably the last three episodes, there's going to be a late slog in April where we could take a bunch of blows. That being said, if we're healthy and playing well, we, we're set up very nicely. Maybe and we can do what the Rockets did and go on a 20-game losing streak. Who knows? Well, and the... Uh... That slog is against the top of the Eastern Conference, and they are just scorched earth right now. Yep. Philly eight and two last ten. Brooklyn eight and two. Milwaukee nine and one last ten. So, so that's that's lingering. But I think I think you're definitely in the spot now where it's it's top four. It is a severe disappointment. Yep. No, absolutely. So again, kind of covered last week. Uh, I mentioned already looking ahead and looking over Ryan's shoulder. Uh, between now and the next time we record, we've got the Heat on Tuesday night. The Magic on Wednesday night, Raptors Friday, Hornets Sunday. I think three and one is absolutely doable uh, in those four games. I legitimately would think two and two is a disappointment. Maybe that's me being a little crazy, but you just haven't seen the Suns drop two games in a row in quite some time or find themselves in a rut. Uh, So I'm hopeful. I hope that uh, that week ends up being a good week. Keep us in a good spot to control our own destiny in terms of the seating, which is great. Uh, and we go towards our conclusion. We end this with a very hot topic, which is probably why we put it at the very end. Uh, and that is the DeAndre Ayton spectrum. Ryan, will you please explain to our listeners the DeAndre Ayton spectrum? And I'll get that pulled up on my phone so I can show the uh, YouTube folks that are watching along with us. Yeah, absolutely. So everybody's favorite son, Scottman, Craig Hamill, who, again, thank you for teaching Cra- us how, Craig, Craig. how to say Craig after Craig. The, uh, the the trade, a.k.a. $110,000 to buy Tory Craig. Tory um, Craig. 
but uh, he put out just kind of some feelers, and it ended up getting a lot of, of traction on Twitter. And he called it the DeAndre Ayton Spectrum. And basically, he just wanted to have everybody put their marker on the spectrum of how they felt about DA. Um, so as you can see, as Ethan showed, um, it ranges from hater all the way to Stan uh, with some other kind of pit stops in between. And it's a good way to kind of gauge how, how everybody's feeling about them. Um, this is a quick temperature with, check. Yeah, just a temperature check. And I mean, the trade deadline is Thursday. So crazier things have happened. Oh my. Um, depending on who's available to be moved, but get them um, for Rashawn Holmes. <laughs> so I, I can go ahead and start out just because um, I'm going to run through this real quick. Yeah, go going, for it. going from hater all the way to stand all the way at the bottom. We have hater dislike, which is point of no return or last stop ready to move on. Disappointed uh, right in the middle pragmatist, which is such a funny word to throw in the middle of the scale. There's so many easier words you could have put there. Uh, the next one, which is where Craig ended up putting himself. Let's see him in the playoffs first. And then we have optimistic and then supporter point of no return last stop and then full on Stan. So pretty good job of the uh, incremental increases there from bottom to top. So Ryan, where are you putting Deandre Aiden? Absolutely. Or where before are you I get my yourself? answer, I do just want to pitch be sure if you're not following him at Craig a Hamill on Twitter, he is a stellar sons follow. Can't recommend him enough. Great but, hair too. Thumbs uh, up. That is, that is also true. Uh, my initial gut reaction had me between disappointed, ready to move on at first. That was just like my first, like, um, you know, reaction check. However, since he put it out and the more I've thought about it, I actually fall, I think closer to pragmatist leaning disappointed that said, if the right offer were on the table, I would be willing to part with them. So I, I would say I'm right in that kind of yellow to orange, starting to fade red a little bit zone towards disappointed, um, unless the right move came along, and then I'd be I'd be okay with it. Now, Philip, so you don't bring. Pretty... I was gonna say, Philip doesn't bring the emotional baggage that we do as people that went into this draft. Uh, if you go through my previous tweets, you will see a <laughs> very, very angry young man. Who I hadn't was, had to console Ethan like that since he was a young toddler. Our, I was was our group chat. Our group chat was crazy that night. I, after that pick, I texted. I said, are you guys okay? And I'm pretty sure Ethan's response was no. I <laughs> I was sharing every Luca video I could find in my last <laughs> effort to somehow convince Robert Sarver and Ryan McDonough with my tweets. But anyway, uh, Philip, you don't bring the emotional baggage. You just bring your uh, basketball uh, analysis here. Where do you put yourself on this chart? Uh, surprisingly, between pragmatist and let's see him in the playoffs first. He He's talented. He's Sorry for the motorcycle gang in my in my neighborhood. This happens they, to heard the you, they heard you praising DA. All They're the time. You. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a celebration around here. Uh, so again, between pragmatists and let's see him in the playoffs because he is talented enough. He is talented enough to win you a game. He has that. He's He's got it. And that is rare at the five. That is rare at the five, especially on the cheap contract that he's that he's on. But I don't think this team needs a hyper-talented playmaking five. You have Chris Paul, Devin Booker, Mikhail Bridges. I'm I'm getting on the Mikhail's going to be a playmaker and not just a finisher for this team. So you don't need, you do, do not need DA to be a playmaker. So because of that, because of that, let's see if he can play just a classic playoff five role, defend hard, set hard screens, dive to the basket and finish when you're around the rim. It's to be a simple approach if he can fill that simple role well, get as much as you can out of him before he demands the bag. And if he demands too much, let him go because you can get the majority of that playoff roles from guys like Willie Cauley Stein for a lot cheaper anyways. Yep. That's, that is why I'm where I'm at, which is probably between disappointed and ready to move on. And I, I'm sorry. I know that's going to upset a lot of people, uh, but I agree. I'm looking long-term. And I'm saying he will never have more value than he does right now, because if we go to the playoffs and he becomes a, you can't have him on the floor in the playoffs type guy, that value goes way down yep. and watching him get abused on the perimeter 
more this season than I was anticipating in a couple stints. And obviously he's played great in others, but you can see how that could become a problem. Uh, I was tweeting back and forth with a son's friend of mine on Twitter who I will keep anonymous here, but I wanted to read this to you because I wanted to get the opinion of someone that is very strong on one side. And this is what I've got here. Uh, again, we'll keep this anonymous. We're almost a number one seed, and all I want to do is crap on Aiden. I'm self-aware enough to know that makes my presence not very necessary. Speaking of Sun's Twitter, uh, <laughs> I'll be elated if he gets moved this week. Honestly, I don't even care if we get good value for him. Him not being our problem anymore is worth a lot. I'd seriously trade him for like Jeremy Lamb. Hopefully they can trick a team into sending back more than that. My goodness, I love that so much. And in reality, it brings me back to the the interview Aiden had where he's like, I'm just here to get a second contract. And man, if the guy somehow secures a bag that is far too large for him and then peters out on us, oh, I'm going to be so sad. Because there are so many people who, again, you have to take away the emotional baggage. And I think Philip did a great job. If you're looking at how he fits on this team, if you're trying to build a contender out of this team, it isn't necessary. I'm not saying he can't help, but it's not necessary. And we joke about Rashawn Holmes, who was beloved by the Suns faithfuls. But my goodness, high motor, never stops, defensive intensity, rim running, jumps at everything, keeps his hands up, slams it down, and you pay him what? A quarter of what Aiton's probably going to be asking for? Like when you're just thinking of how to build the team as a whole, I can't, I can't defend the money that Aiden's probably going to get because I think Bridges is owed more money and simply based off of the place they were picked. I don't think that's going to happen, but we will stop ourselves here because we don't want to get too spicy on DeAndre Aiden because hold up, though. hold up, hold up. Hold on. Giving you a if minute. Mc, giving you a minute. If McHale, if McHale doesn't get as much as DeAndre Ayton, we take to the streets. Period. I'm <laughs> flying to Phoenix. I'm the flying to Phoenix. Green, the streets of Bowling Green, Green Kentucky will be. No, out I'm there flying to Phoenix. Offenses. I'm not even a fan. I'm flying to Phoenix. Hey, I, I I'm just telling you right now. Don't be surprised when it happens. Just be prepared to be heartbroken. Much be like quiet. much like I told myself going into a certain draft when a certain player was not taken at a certain <laughs> pick. But hey. It is what it is. Things happen. Things change. Just like the name of our podcast, which you like that? Did you you like that? That was, that was clean. Call that a segue, you right? That, that didn't was you? Clean. Well, everybody, again, thank you for joining us. Uh, whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on any of the podcast platforms, we appreciate you. Uh, we're pretty excited. We've got some cool stuff coming up here uh, that we're excited to share with you, and so. On behalf of Ryan and Philip, this has been Into the Valley. I'm Ethan Shutt, and... Unlock Mikhail Bridges. We out. That's what you're supposed to say. We out. <laughs>